As we scramble to find better solutions to our plastic waste problem, the bio-based plastics have become a promising new alternative. The funny thing is, they aren't new at all. In fact, one of the most widely used bio-based plastics around the world was made back in the 1930s, almost 100 years ago. What I'm talking about is PLA. What it do, I'm Lumi and welcome to The Bench Talk, where we explore our plastic planet. Now, most of the plastics you use every day can be separated into two categories, synthetic and bio-based. The reason why we have these two distinctions is to describe where the source material comes from. Synthetic plastics start life as crude oil and an offshoot product of how we make things like gasoline and diesel. I actually recently made a video about this, which you can watch after this one down in the description. These synthetic plastics include things like polyethylene and polybutadiene and make up most of the plastic you use every day, from grocery bags to cleaning bottles to car tires. But if you've been paying attention, people aren't so happy with plastics right now. Since the 1970s and 80s, awareness about the harms of plastic pollution has been spreading, and with the growing concern of microplastics and now nanoplastics, it's not surprising that trying to make plastic from plants instead of oil has become trendy and popular. But as I said in the intro, bio-based plastics are nothing new. So why don't we make all the plastic we use today bio-based from the beginning? In order to answer that question, we have to take a closer look at one of the most widely used bio-based plastics in the world, PLA. PLA is a bio-based plastic made from lactic acid and was invented by this dude, Wallace Carruthers. Now, Wallace isn't just a random old guy in black and white. If you know anything about polymer chemistry, you'd know Wallace Carruthers is one of the fathers of modern day polymer science. People like him are the reason why we understand so much about how polymers are made and why they behave the way they do. Born in 1896, Wallace began his career at DuPont in 1927 after being convinced to leave his job at Harvard. In his time at DuPont, Wallace was a very successful chemist who invented other polymers like nylon and neoprene in addition to PLA. He was the very definition of an overachiever. And while nylon and neoprene found commercial success, especially during World War II, PLA didn't find its footing due to its high cost of production. As a result, PLA was sort of pushed aside as a neat idea, but nothing that would be of true use, especially when compared to the other synthetic plastics that were pivotal to the war effort at the time. But hopefully, y'all actually liked this video a little more than they liked PLA back then. Fast forward to the 1970s, another war is what finally gave PLA its chance to shine. In 1973, the Arab-Israeli war caused a huge stir for the United States. After showing its support for Israel by providing them with supplies, the Arab members of OPEC, that is the Organization for Petroleum Exporting Countries, cut us off. This resulted in skyrocketing gas prices and brought the American populace to a standstill as these oil-producing countries refused to export oil to the US. It was this experience that caused America to realize how reliant they were on foreign sources of oil and resulted in the Nixon administration making a big push to bring back domestic oil production. As you can imagine, this cutoff really brought a whole new meaning to the question, you got gas money? But it also severely hurt our ability to make synthetic plastics. With this in mind, two chemists, Patrick and Sally Gruber, invented a new inexpensive way to make PLA on their kitchen stove in 1989. Apparently, chemistry on your kitchen stove was a popular thing to do back in the 80s. Up until then, no one knew of a way to make PLA that would make sense commercially, and this discovery is what helped increase PLA adoption. PLA is a polyester polymer that can be made from most plant sugars, but is most commonly made from corn. If you've ever driven through the Midwest of the United States, you would know we make a lot of corn. In fact, the US is the largest producer of corn in the world and uses about 39 million hectares of land to just grow corn. That alone would be ninth place in the world in terms of total arable land, more than countries like Nigeria and Ukraine. And there's no way we could actually eat all this corn, but that's why it's used to produce so many things. Corn is not only used as a food source for us and farm animals, it's in most of the food products in your grocery store and is even used in the production of soap and cardboard. Being such a widely available source of plant starches makes it a great feedstock for making bio-based plastics like PLA. But how exactly do we go from corn ear to corn ear? Well, that's actually quite simple and is somewhat similar to how we make corn-based alcohol like bourbon. When corn is picked from the field, it goes through what's called a wet milling process. 
This is a common method in fruit production where the corn is first soaked in hot water and then milled to remove everything but the cornstarch. Once the cornstarch has been separated, it's broken down by enzymes or acid into corn sugar. A key thing to note here is cornstarch is a natural polymer made of many sugar molecules known as glucose. That's why it can be broken down into corn sugar in the first place. Once we have our corn sugar, it can be fermented into lactate as long as there's no oxygen and the right bacteria or enzyme is used. That lactate from the fermentation process can now be converted to lactic acid and then polymerized into PLA. It's a pretty simple process on paper, but there's actually a lot more involved that just won't fit in this episode, especially since I still need time to actually subscribe if you haven't done so already. But seriously, it's cool how we take one polymer from nature, chop it up, add a little seasoning, and stitch it back together. So now that we have this wonderful corn plastic, why don't we use it to replace all other plastic? The truth is PLA does have its uses, but it won't work for every application. For one, PLA tends to warp and bend at relatively low temperatures. If you were to leave some PLA in your car during the summertime, you would find it held up as well as passing student loan forgiveness. PLA is also hard and brittle, which won't work for some applications that need some flexibility. But one of the biggest issues is that though this corn-based plastic is bio-based, that doesn't mean it's biodegradable in the way you're thinking. For PLA to truly degrade, it requires very specific conditions that rarely exist outside of an industrial composter. That means I can't just take this tiny PLA boat and chuck it in my backyard and expect for it to be gone in, let's say, a year. In fact, in natural environments, PLA can take upwards of 80 to possibly hundreds of years to degrade. Recycling PLA also isn't as straightforward as other oil-based plastics since it can't be recycled with them for fear of contamination. It can only be accepted in industrial composters, of which there are only about 185 in the US. And even at these locations, it will still take at least six months to see a real difference. So PLA isn't the miracle plastic we thought it could be, but that doesn't mean researchers have stopped looking for bio-based alternatives. Make sure you get subscribed down below so you don't miss a new episode where we explore some of these new materials being created and the truth behind bio-based plastics. I'm Lumi, thanks for coming to the Bench Talk, and remember, keep thinking.